and um, a very warm welcome to this session here today, um, this In Conversation event on Narrative Economics, How Stories Go Viral and Drive Major Economic Events. So we know intuitively that economics and good economic policy making isn't just about the money and it isn't just about facts and numbers. And I think that Janet Yellen, the former chair of the Federal Reserve, captured this really well when she said of central bank policy making, sometimes the explanation is the policy. In other words, what people are saying and the stories which they use to make sense of the world is itself a fundamental driver of the life choices. Things like how much people spend, how much they save, and how they vote. So we at the Behavioural Insights team are absolutely delighted to have with us today Professor Bob Schiller, whose book on narrative economics is just out and available in the conference venue bookshop, if you'd like to go and have a look at that after the event. Um, Bob hardly needs an introduction, but he's the 2013 Nobel Prize laureate and founder of the field of behavioral finance. And he's also Sterling Professor at the Department of Economics at Yale University. We're absolutely delighted that Bob has been able to take time out to spend a week in London, including attending this conference. And hopefully, given current political events, he's also um, taking the opportunity to observe some real life narratives in operation too here in London. We're also honored to have with us Dame Manu Shafiq, who will be chairing this In Conversation event. Manoush is a leading economist whose career has straddled public policy, both central banking and civil, senior civil service, as well as academia as well. And she's currently director of the London School of Economics and Political Science since September 2017. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over. And Bob is going to kick off by telling us about what we mean by narratives and why they're so consequential. And then we'll hand over to Manoush, who will be chairing the event. Also, to let you know, there will be an opportunity for questions towards the end. So please submit any questions that you have in the usual way on the Slido app. And um, we'll come to those later on. But in the meantime, I'll hand over to Bob. Thank you. Okay, well, my new book has the audacity to coin a term, narrative economics. Um, but I think it's a subset of behavioral economics. It's a little different, though, than, you know, I think that when you have re revolutions in science, they're often associated with new data and new opportunities, uh, or new ways of uh, doing studies. So there was a revolution in economics in the 1930s when uh, GDP was developed, when countries started computing unemployment rates and publishing them regularly. So we had new kinds of data that led to a decade-long development of Keynesian economics. Um, then we had the behavioral uh, economics revolution. Uh, it's hard to date that, uh, maybe from the 1980s or the 1990s. These are kind of social epidemics, and that's what I'm into thinking about now. They tend to stake off very gradually at first and hardly noticed. Then they become big. And then eventually, it, uh, expect it to eventually fade. That's the way uh, social epidemics work. But it might take a long time. So narrative economics, I define as being influenced by a yet new data set. It's called digitized speech, human speech or text. And uh, you have electronic versions of business publications, of general newspapers, magazines, books, uh, sermons, diaries, all sorts of things are being digitized. And people can search them now and use modern uh, natural language processing and search for ideas. So that's what I'm thinking will be the next revolution. It will, uh, it will advance our understanding of economic events. Uh, 
so uh, I, I wrote this book when the revolution was already getting underway. Uh, and I'll uh, show a little bit of evidence for that. This, this is a, uh, now again, I'm already searching digitized text. JSTOR is a database that has scholarly journals in all fields, uh, generally back to their beginning. So uh, you can search. So I searched for the word narrative in journals uh, in anthropology, economics, finance, history, political science, psychology, and sociology. Uh, the, the black lines are uh, the number, the percent of articles that contain the word narrative uh, in all years. And the thing that jumps out at me is that economics, and especially finance within economics, are the worst fields. Uh, and I think that uh, that reflects a certain atmosphere in these professions uh, that uh, they, they imagine that the economy is driven mainly, or entirely actually, by real world economic forces. Things like exhaustion of natural resources, inventions, uh, things that are not human at all. Uh, and they, they, they tend to model people as being consistent utility maximizers who never change their mind uh, about things. Um, now, it's changing. You note that in every one of these fields, there's more talk in the current decade, that's the gray line, than there was overall. So I see signs of a general uh, scholarly revolution. They're all affected by data. And maybe there's more than that involved in this. But to me, it's coming back to reality. The important thing I'm saying that we've been missing is that people change their minds. And, they, and the way they change their minds involves human speech. Otherwise, they'd all be independent and they wouldn't average out to nothing. And it takes the form of narratives. Most people do not read scholarly journals. And so when they change their mind, it's, it's something they heard in the form of a story, typically a human interest story, a story that involves them with a sense of identity. Uh, people are political. And, and these stories carry with it morals or ideas. Now, the word narrative is often taken as a synonym for story. And sometimes that's how it's used. But actually, more... For, a narrative has a meaning more of a telling of a story. And it involves some conviction that this story is important. It may have a moral, it may have a path, may have a behavior pattern that you might want to imitate, a script for your action. You never really think these things through, but you follow the script that you've heard because it seems you don't know what else to do, <laughs> we'll follow that. Uh, an economic narrative is the small subset of all these narratives. There's millions of narratives going around that influence economic behavior that might encourage you to save more, withdraw spending, or invest, or uh, the like. And I think these are associated with economic fluctuations. So in order to get a sense of reality about economic fluctuations, we have to look at the epidemic patterns of narratives. So. Um, let me talk now about uh, mathematical epidemiology uh, a bit. And this is uh, an example of an epidemic. We use the word going viral as a metaphor for an epidemic. There are real epidemics. And this is uh, an example. I just took this one of many. It's just a, a random choice. It shows instances by week, starting from one, week number one, of an outbreak of Ebola in uh, Lofa County, Liberia. It doesn't matter where this is. It's, it tends to be, this is called an epidemic curve. The epidemic starts out and it's growing. The mathematical models will say it grows on the left side of this chart when the contagion rate exceeds the recovery rate. So uh, that's how it grows. People get over this disease and then they stop being contagious. On the other, it eventually peaks, and there's many reasons why it might peak. The contagion rate may go down because of improved medical uh, facilities. Or even if there's no medical facilities, the contagion rate goes down because many people are now immune to it. 
uh, even if it's, uh, even if not everyone will, will get immune to it, but it'll be enough to push the contagion rate below the recovery rate. And then the thing goes on a long path uh, out to week uh, 2021 when there are still new cases, but it's always less and less, and it's asymptotic. To, maybe not to be to zero, maybe some, it's a complicated field. I'm not gonna get into uh, the math here. But I think that the mathematical epidemiology suggests ways of forecasting that could be combined with economic models. So I want to look at an, a couple of examples of uh, economic, uh, uh, economic epidemics. At the left, this is years 1850 to 2018. At the left, I have bimetallism. Now, you, that may not immediately mean anything to you, uh, it, but it was an uh, extremely exciting new idea to replace the gold standard with a bimetallic standard. There was a conference in London in 1894, international conference, big deal. Where is that? Right there at the peak, uh, or just about there. If you go back and read about it, people were really excited about bimetallism. You can't imagine that, but I'll say you can if you think of Bitcoin. It seems to me it's the same epidemic all over. Well, different, and it has to be updated. It's a mutation of the bimetallism uh, epidemic. People are, think it's cool to invent a new kind of money, and they like it if it involves computers, <clears throat> and they're excited. This epidemic was contagious because it came at a time when young people were feeling threatened by computers and artificial intelligence <clears throat> replacing them. Uh, and it was just a perfect story. The idea that Satoshi Nakamoto couldn't be found and no one ever remembered meeting him. And he started this, through his pure genius, this uh, epidemic uh, of uh, Bitcoin. And it's, it shows it's, it's human triumphant over computers and over governments. It's just such a great story. There's a lot of smart people in computer science and in cryptography. They never got the attention. It was this story that drove the epidemic. I think that life is like that. Uh, this shows economic theories. Uh, I picked names of economic theories that are rec computer recognizable and are old so that we can see the whole epidemic curve. But ISLM model, real business cycle model, overlapping generations model, and multiplier accelerator model. I have them plotted back to 1930, well, 1940 here. Uh, and they're all hump-shaped like an epidemic curve. The, what happens is for a while, the contagion is great. It's a cool story. Uh, and then after a while, it falters a little bit, and then uh, down we go. Uh, this is the depressing truth of life as an economist or a scholar in any field. You can hope to become famous with your theories, but at, first of all, it'll take 10 years. So for example, the, over the uh, real, uh, sorry, the multiplier accelerator model, which is the uh, double line curve there. Uh, Samuelson wrote that paper in 1939, and it didn't become famous until sometime in the 1950s. That's the way it is. So don't be disappointed if you publish an article and it's not quoted at all at first. It, it takes a while for epidemics to get going. This, that's the inspirational side. The sad side is they're going to forget about you eventually, no matter what you do. <laughs> now, I emphasize in my book that it's not a single narrative. There's so many different narratives that economists are confused by them and don't want to talk about them. But it's actually constellations of narratives, which is what I call that. A bunch of narratives around a theme, like Boris Johnson or like Donald Trump. Somehow people, this is what epidemiologists call co-epidemics. These different stories support each other. Once you've heard a story about Donald Trump, you're interested and you want to hear more stories, or maybe not. <laughs> the recovery comes eventually. Uh, but this shows an example of uh, people talking about panics. Uh, this is from 1800 to 2000, and I'm looking at the Panic of 1837, the Panic of 1857, the Panic of 1873, the Panic of 1893, and the Panic of 1907. Now you, know, now you might say this is not just words, but I think it's not. It's 
growing psychological sophistication of the public and attributing economic events to panic, which is, a sci which is an emotional state. In the panic of 1837, look there, there's nothing. Nobody called it the panic of 1837 until years later. And then you see that all these different panics, they suddenly jump after the event occurs, like uh, look at the panic of 1907. It just jumps up enormously when it happened. But there's a pattern of all of them. It was a growing public concern about panics. Uh, and, and then it, it ended with the panic of 1907. I don't know why. We had more, but the, the, the words change. But I, I, it's a difficult thing to know what the real meaning of the word change is, but I think there is a difference. Later, we developed, we, ch we switched from panic to confidence. And then we started developing confidence in, well, there was, I'm sorry, yeah, I don't have that slide, I'm sorry. Another narrative, which I think is late, somewhat latent now, but in danger of mutating and becoming epidemic again, is the labor-saving machinery narrative. That the black line shows counts from the years 1800 to 2008 of the use of the word, the, the phrase, labor-saving machinery. And you can see that it started essentially around the Luddite uh, riots in 1811, and it grew uh, until around uh, the Great Depression, and then it started to fade. The technological unemployment narrative uh, jumped to enormous heights at the time of the Great Depression in, 19, in 1930. Well, slightly before that, it was going up in the late 1920s, but it, it became a huge epidemic. Uh, so technological unemployment is, they invent some fancy new machine, a robot maybe, that, uh, that rude robot was starting to appear. Uh, and that, that machine took your job away. And that means you're not going to get it back. This is permanent. This is a whole new era that we're moving into. Uh, after that, they dropped the word technological unemployment. But it was replaced by the word automation in the 1950s. There was another epidemic. And it was replaced by uh, artificial intelligence lately. Uh, we're in a big artificial intelligence epidemic right now. But it doesn't seem to be scaring people that much. But it could, again, if we had high unemployment in the next recession, and people started attributing it to uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, finally, you may doubt that uh, people thought that. Our, our story, we, the, the Great Depression is a story that everybody knows. It's still an epidemic. It's still going. But the technological unemployment side of it is missing. Nobody connects the, uh, the Great Depression to technological unemployment uh, now. I just point out that Albert Einstein was a firm believer. He had a theory of the Great Depression. According to my conviction, it cannot be doubted that the severe economic depression is to be traced back for the most part to internal economic causes. Improvement in the apparatus of production through technical invention and organization has decreased the need for human labor and thereby caused the elimination of a part of labor from the economic circuit and thereby causing a progressive decrease in the purchasing power of the consumers. So Einstein was presumably a smart guy and he was absolutely convinced that this was the cause of the depression. I think it was, he may have been right, it was the cause of the depression, but it was the narrative, not the truth of the narrative. The narrative doesn't have to be true and it can be contagious if the counter narrative that opposes it is not contagious. So I think that was my concluding remarks, and we'll turn it over to Manoush. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob, and thank you for uh, giving us a, 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 very, a very good overview of some of the themes in, in your book. And just about a few hundred meters away from here, across Parliament Square, there is a massive battle of narratives going on around Brexit. How, in your framework, do you think about the Brexit narrative? And how, where in the trajectory, I, I mean, I think we all keep hoping that it will just end, but we're clearly still on the rising trend in terms of the degree to which Brexit is being discussed. 
what will bring the beginning of the, I don't want to say the end of Brexit. When, when will we stop? Yeah. When will the narrative Brexit, when will the Brexit narrative break and when will we move yeah. on to another conversation? I, th I think the Brexit narrative might break after there's some d decisive event, like actual exit or, or something that stops it. Hmm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the narrative it will disappear. Hmm. Uh, so I, I, I like an interesting example is the inverted yield curve narrative which has been so prominent. The, the inverted yield curve is when the uh, uh, short rate, short-term interest rate is higher than the long-term interest rate, which is reputed to be a uh, leading indicator. Uh, if I do a search like I've done with here for, for uh, that uh, narrative, the, just the word inverted yield curve, uh, I find that it tends to occur when there's an inverted yield curve. <laughs> and so it's not... It, it doesn't follow the uh, simple epidemic model, uh, except locally. Mm. But, the, but it's been growing. The, the basic narrative keeps coming back every time we have an inverted yield curve, and it's been coming back stronger with each one. So we have, a, we have an inverted yield curve narrative right now, which is stronger than it's ever been. Mm. And it's convincing a lot of people that the uh, depression, uh, a recession, is, that no one will say depression. That's... Uh, like shouting fire in a crowded theater. The recession will come back mm -hmm. worldwide. But it seems to me that it's another case, quite plausibly, of, of self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. These uh, reactions to the inverted yield curve have become stronger through time. Uh, just nobody talked about inverted yield curve before 1970. Mm. Uh, but now, now it's kind of like a, a magical thinking that uh, some uh, behavioral scientists talk about that mm. Uh, if you observe some pattern uh, that you think forecasts, then you'll make it, uh, you'll make make it happen. True. It's a bit like <laughs> Keynes forecasting the forecasts of others in the beauty contest story. Yes, uh, where that's a lovely self story. It's self-fulfilling, isn't it? You know the beauty contest story. He was referring, I, I went back to try to find his beauty contest. They were advertised in newspapers. They would show a page of the newspaper filled up with a hundred photos of pretty faces, and you were supposed to enter the contest by sending in the six prettiest in your estimation. And you would win the contest if your six prettiest came closest to the global consensus. So what you have to do to win that contest is not to pick the, what you think are the six prettiest, because you know that you're different. You're trying to figure out what the average person would think mm. are the six prettiest. Uh, I found, I searched for that. I couldn't find the one that he describes in the general theory, but I found a lot, newspapers ran beauty contests all the time. And the, but I think that he said that that's like the stock market. That's you right. don't pick the best stock, in your opinion. You're, you're a short-term trader who wants to sell it to someone else. You try to pick the stock that the, the average person will soon think is the best stock. Right. So let me bring you back just for a moment to Brexit and the Brexit narrative. You said the the, the narrative itself won't go away. What do you think was the, the narrative that drove Brexit? Now, I'm at a little disadvantage here because I'm not British. Yes. And uh, I'll, I'll have to say, I, mean, I thought when I first heard about Brexit that it would not be contagious in the United States. But uh, I have to say, we are getting onto the Brexit worrying. I don't know. <laughs> It's becoming, maybe it's because we, we somehow link it to our own political situation. Yeah. Uh, it's become a story of polarization in society, and people are very interested in that. So let me move you to the United States. Clearly part of your motive in this book is to understand the Trump narrative. There's a, that's right. a sort of underlying theme. Talk to us a little bit about how you think narrative economics has played out in the Trump administration. If you want to read a book about narrative economics, I recommend that you read Donald Trump, who lays it all out for his <laughs> readers. Well, actually, his ghostwriter did, but uh, after talking to him. So I recommend his book, How to Think Like a Billionaire, if you want to understand. <laughs> he talks about how you project yourself into a public... Uh, or or he, uh, he had another book called Think Big, uh, How to uh, Kick Ass in, in Business and Life. That, but they changed the name of that when, when he was running for president. To think bigly? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, he should have said think bigly. 
<laughs> they, they took kick ass out of it. Oh, That's okay. unpresidential. He tries a little bit to be presidential. <laughs> so, so he tells you that you have to build a narrative. It, yeah. it doesn't use exactly that word. Yes. And that your whole life should be a story. You, you have to live the story that you want. Uh, and you, you always present yourself as living that story. That's why he played golf during the uh, hurricane, the Dorian. It's because he has to, cre it sounds counterintuitive, but it has to feed into his image of the person who's really living life to the fullest, admired by millions. And uh, you can learn from this man. <laughs> I'm not sure you want to do it, but. <laughs> well, let's, let's turn to another aspect which Trump has exploited, but which is also a wider phenomenon, which is the role of social media. You talk a lot about ancient narratives and old narratives, and you remind us that narratives spread virally long before we had social media. Yeah. But has social media changed both the pace that narratives evolve at, the shape of that curve, and the impact that narratives have? You know, in terms of the existence of narratives in the past, I include in my book a quote from a man named Alexander Windmill, who lived in the American colonies. And in 1765, during the recession after the end of the Seven Years' War, uh, he wrote about narratives. And he said, there is a certain phrase that he keeps hearing. And the phrase was, there is no money. And he tried to estimate how often that was said in the American colonies in the year 1765. Mm -hmm. And his estimate was 50 million times a day. Uh, and he thought there are only 3 million people mm -hmm. <laughs> in the colonies. I think he's wrong. It was probably more like a million times a day. Uh, but he said everyone's hearing this and everyone's commenting on how everyone's saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it can happen that long ago, in 1765. Uh, so it's not entirely new. But I, I think the internet does change the equation a little bit. One thing it, uh, one thing it does is allows you to find like-minded people and get reinforcement from them. Okay. So it, it, it helps polarization. Mm. Uh, back in 1765, you had to spread it with people you met on the street. or. Uh, and I, th I think, uh, yeah, the social media also changed the atmosphere. They, they have things like they invite you to say whether you like this uh, story or not. Mm. And it becomes more personal. You get rejected or you get reinforced. Uh, so maybe it tends to help you build identity around common themes. So let's turn to the policy world. Given how important narratives are in shaping economic behavior, should policymakers be in the business of trying to manage narratives, uh, both trying to prevent misleading narratives from getting traction, right. or actually promoting positive narratives that they think will be for the social good? I mean, in a previous generation, we might have called this propaganda, but let's call it, <laughs> let's, let's, yeah. let's, let's talk about it in a different framework. What do you think? Well, politicians, of course, are already in this business. And the successful politicians are usually ones that are good at it. Mm. So I, I first heard Boris Johnson give a speech at the World Economic Forum. And I thought, he's really good. <laughs> he's, mm. I didn't see any problem with him at that, <laughs> at that time. Um, so, but the question is whether in a, in a socially minded uh, spirit, uh, so in, in kind of civil servants, government officials yeah. be developing narrative tools as part of their... Yeah, toolkit. the problem is that some of them have misused it and uh, they, they discredit themselves eventually. So um, Herbert Hoover during the Great Depression kept saying the economy... He's our president of the United States. The, present, the economy is fundamentally sound. And he's right about that. It was just all these narratives that were driving the economy down. But he kept making the mistake of saying, in, uh, implying that it would be a matter of months and we'd be back. Mm. And it kept getting worse instead of better. Mm. And he then became a laughing stock. So it, it takes some subtlety of uh, understanding to make it right. Mm. And what is the f what do you think should happen next in terms of how we think about narratives? What's the future of research in this area? What are the questions we should be asking? 
to, to use this framework to understand the world better? Well, I think that the research shouldn't be so uh, focused on the marketing department of the business school, uh, which uh, think about these, they've been thinking about these things for years. I think marketing is a very important field uh, and it shouldn't maybe be just in the business school teaching people how to spin narratives. Uh, uh, as for our other agenda, I think that we need to collect data more systematically. I'm, um, I'm disappointed so far with the church sermon database. Uh, as far as, you know, I haven't studied this uh, as much as I should, but tell me if I'm wrong, if I'm other. If you want to search church sermons, you're, you're forced to rely on databases which were constructed for ministers uh, to help them write their sermons. And it tends to take classic sermons. I want to see the sermons that some little small town church uh, used. Uh, now, I, I've already done this a little bit. It used, newspapers used to report on sermons. And so I, I was able to read reports of sermons on the Sunday after the stock market crash of 1929. And boy, were they moralizing. Uh, and you could see something of the reaction. Uh, it was suddenly not so great to be a rich man. <laughs> it was uh, stock market. It didn't involve most people. Most people didn't own any stocks, but they heard it about as a major moral crisis. Interesting. And I think that that, that helped explain the depression that followed. Because there was an immediate cutback in consumer spending, right. as Christy Rom uh, Romer has documented. Hmm. Uh, and... Uh, why did people react so much to the stock market crash? It didn't even involve them. Interesting. I'll encourage people to send in questions on Slido and maybe just to take off on that point. Do you, um, do you think central bank policy didn't have a role in the Great Depression in, in terms of... Oh, yeah. The central bank in the United States yes. raised interest rates. Yes. And this became a focal point. Now, the central bank in the United States didn't just do that. They also issued statements that were um, attempting to be neutral, but you read it and you'll, you'll see that they doubted that the stock market should be soaring at yeah. such a level. Yeah. So uh, the, the stock market grew something like 30% in the five months before the 1929 crash. And there were people saying, this has gotten totally insane. Uh, and these people didn't convince anyone until there was a crash. So the idea of a crash was already on, on people's minds, set by the discussion, partly by the F Federal Reserve and partly by just general newspapers. In January 1, 1929, this was eight months before the crash, the New York Times wrote an editorial uh, on their J January 1 newspaper, uh, lead editorial, that the craziness in the stock market has to stop. Uh, now, people have thought, well, it's just the New York Times, but uh, they started to believe it after, after it actually made a 12% drop in one day. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, let me uh, see if there are any questions from the audience at this stage. Is there? I see. I'll take a, an old fashioned style question, not through an app. Go for it. <laughs> Well, the human species is it's a, a human universal. Hmm. Uh, uh, the book by Don Brown called, he's an anthropologist, Human Universal is fascinating. Hmm. Uh, one thing, any human society, if you go in and photograph them, they're standing facing each other or they're sitting down around a campfire uh, talking. Uh, and, they're, and they're polite to each other, uh, somewhat. There's a sense of politeness. They're searching in the other person's eyes to see if the person is responding. And what are they doing? They're telling stories. And uh, you can search on the web for a primitive society with subtitles. I wish there were more of this, but you can occasionally find a conversation that somebody filmed of some people from very remote cultures. And what are they talking about? It sounds so normal. It's some kind of gossip about somebody. And so it's part of what human species uh, developed to convey information or to convey a converse, a, a sense of uh, agreement. 
Uh, and it, but as we say, with uh, there are heuristics involved, it's not perfected by evolution yet. And so it leads people to sometimes uh, do anomalous things that are contrary to uh, the best information. They don't. Now, we've developed it at uh, academic settings, like the present, where we are doing better in our conversations. But when you talk about the whole population, it's not there yet. Okay, I've got some questions coming in because my iPad isn't working. So let me, uh, let me take, let me, I'm afraid I'm going to go back to Brexit. How important is it that a narrative is neat and simple, such as take back control, which was the key Brexit narrative, versus more complex narratives, which is arguably what the Remain side tried to, tried to foster? Yeah, that's, that was the problem. The Remain side... Uh, had to uh, talk about real economic theory, I guess, and data uh, and history, history that people maybe don't know about. That's, that's a problem with the current state of humanity. Yes. But does this mean we are doomed to simplification and rhetoric uh, rather than you're talking to a very, I'm assuming, a very evidence-based policy nerdy audience who live off of data and rigor, are, are our lot doomed if we can't engage in that kind of rhetorical oversimplification of reality? Uh, well, we have what's called civil society. Uh, that's a term that I think emerged in the 1700s, but it refers to a, a, um, a society in which you have respect for others' views and you're willing to back down. Mm. Uh, and uh, you have a somewhat selfless, selfless spirit. Uh, we had that, and we still do. Uh, there are aberrations, but uh, it's not all uh, narratives. Well, civil society is itself a narrative. We model yes. our, uh, uh, when you see uh, a party, a losing party accept losses, that is uh, a sign of civil society. I took it very troubling when Donald Trump suggested before his election that if he loses, he will accuse them of fraud. Yes. This is before it happened, and uh, that was troubling. Uh, up, up until then, I don't think any presidential candidate had uh, tried to say that it wasn't a, mean of any, a, a real loss. Yeah. Do you think some groups are better than others? This is again, another question at using narratives, and what, what is it about them that makes them better? Well, that's the mis... It, 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 it goes beyond just narratives. It goes to... Uh, the human species, as I enter, emphasize in the book, is very attuned to narratives, which are sequences of events built around some theme or some emotion. But it, similarly, the human mind is also uh, a, a music-oriented. Uh, and Donald Brown, in his book on human universals, every human society has music. Not only that, every human society has special music for children. Uh, uh, and I also have special stories for children. So th this is in everybody's mind. And it, 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 neuroscience suggests that it's built in. <laughs> so we can't avoid that. But we can uh, encourage... We, we have to try to encourage narratives that, that uh, are more truthful and honest. Another thing that's happening now is there has been a narrative about dishonest news media. Yes. Uh, and uh, people would back down when the Times said something <laughs> authoritatively, but they don't anymore. Uh, our President Trump talks about the failing New York Times or lying New York Times uh, all the time. And it's become an assumption. Uh, so when the New York Times provided evidence that Donald Trump had inherited over $400 million in today's dollars from his father, which would put him as a billionaire if he just invested it in the stock market and did nothing, he just denied it. And he said, I never took anything from my father. I just borrowed a million or so, and mm -hmm. I paid it back. He's lying, but he can get away with it. Mm. Uh, his word is for many people better than the word of a research team at the New York Times. I don't think that could have happened before. Mm -hmm. I've got several questions around how do you uh, have positive narratives? How do you uh, change 
public opinion in a way that's more constructive? How do you get the media to be uh, more positive? How, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, uh, you know, you're asking me to fulfill the mission of the journalism school. <laughs> and there are many journalism schools, and I do not have a degree in communications. Uh, I defer to them. Mm. But part of it, what they do teach their students is a uh, use of narratives. Yeah. So they will tell, I think you know this probably, but they'll tell their journalism students, when you write up an article, start with a human example. So if it's an article about uh, some health news, you don't start by saying scientists say this. You start by giving an example of someone who was in ill health and then did this and now is testifying that it's great. Now th that is also kind of unfortunate because one person's testimony would mean nothing to modern medical research. Yeah. But it just isn't resonant. You have to have some picture in your mind. Maybe they can get a photograph of the person that they're talking about. What about some of the movements afoot to regulate social media in terms of uh, forcing them to take down fake news, uh, some nudge-like strategies where they're, every time you see an article that agrees with your, with your views, you automatically are shown a right, opposing right. view. Do you think any of those kind of regulatory or kind of behavioral interventions are likely to make our narratives more balanced, less polarized. Yeah, absolutely. So the idea of automatically forwarding news to fit your prejudices is a dangerous practice. And there could be regulations against that. Uh, I point out that we've had, uh, freedom of speech is a delicate thing. And I suppose you have to turn to the law school for authoritative discussion of this. Mm. But uh, freedom of speech has always been somewhat limited uh, notably, we have laws against libel or defamation of character based on lies. So if a newspaper runs articles saying that you've done some crimes and it's a total fabrication, you can sue the newspaper and get the relief. Yes. Uh, now that could be misused. That's why we need civil society. And civil society thrives on narratives, however, that we have a th civil society and so that you do back down uh, based on narratives that suggest that uh, it's the right thing to do and eventually truth will prevail. Let me take you back to financial markets and the economy, Bob. I have a question. Do you observe financial market participants trying to identify, model, and profit from narrative economics? They're starting to. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of these people are working at hedge funds and they don't want to publish their research, but there, there, there's more and more people who are uh, doing some kind of computer searches. So m my wish is that we're, that we're just more integrated into uh, modern economics and finance uh, so that we'd have models that aren't misleading in their uh, oversimplification. I'm not saying we reject the existing models because there's an element of truth. All of those models I showed, they're all defunct models, or almost so. Mm. But they, they're all interesting, and they have an element of truth to them. And they come back in public policy, even though they may not be being taught uh, enthusiastically in the economics curriculum. Yes. What about uh, the economic narrative of irrational exuberance? <laughs> that was a I took that as a title of a book I wrote in 2000. So I like it. And I don't think I, <laughs> I, don't think I coined the word. I, uh, I, I had testified before the Federal Reserve Board just before Alan Greenspan. Greenspan used it, yeah. So then I got reporters calling me, asking me if I said that. And I honestly think, I don't know, but I don't think I did. I think that's Alan Greenspan. I think so. Um, so he said that during a speech. The origin of that narrative, it shows how somehow the successful narratives are kind of random. So he was speaking, Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Fed, was speaking in an evening dinner speech in Washington, D.C. U.S. markets were closed. And he, he one, I was watching it on TV, but I, I shut it off because it was boring. <laughs> I went to bed. But later in the speech, he said approximately, how do we know whether the U.S. stock market is going through a period of irrational exuberance as did the Japanese market in 1990, which led to a crash. 
I didn't get that at all right, but it, he made a reference to Japan and a reference to the possibility that Japan may have been artificially exuberant. Well, the Japan market was open and it immediately crashed. It, didn't, it went down a few percent. So that shows that people in Japan were watching this televised speech and immediately reacted. And that became a narrative. And then, by the way, when the European markets opened, mm. they crashed. And when the UK markets opened, they crashed. And then it came to New York. It was moving around the world as the markets opened. What a wonderful story. It went viral. <laughs> and the term irrational exuberance, which wasn't meant to be such a great phrase. He just used it once. Yeah. Never wanted to use it again because he didn't want to create another crash. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it shows how psycho... And it was taken as, a, as a evidence for psychology of the market. Now nobody remembers those opening reasons for it. Mm -hmm. Now, once it's contagious, it has a life of its own. A similar one to that is, of course, when Mario Draghi said he would do whatever it takes to save the right. euro. And that narrative became arguably the turning point for, uh, for the resolution of the euro crisis. I don't know whether you agree that I that agree that uh, decisive. Uh, that is, that, there's a few words in that statement, but it's a little edgy. To say it will do whatever it takes suggests that you've lost reason and <laughs> compromise. <laughs> So uh, it's the edginess of that may, may, have, uh, may have made it popular. And that might have saved the day. Yeah. The other side of it is if you... And it was also unscripted. I know that it was an unscripted, off-the-cuff remark, but it got yeah. huge prominence. The other side, he could say something equally uh, seemingly careless or benign, but it could carelessly cause the other. Uh, during the 2007-2008 crisis, prime ministers around the world justified their actions by saying we don't want another Great Depression. I think that might have been a mistake. It was politically expedient for the moment to justify it, but that raised the specter of the Great Depression. And mm -hmm. it, as I showed in a slide, really brought back the old narrative, which people remember from years ago. Can I ask you a different question? One of the prevailing narratives in politics today is this nostalgic theme. Uh, making America great again, uh, you know, making Britain great again, uh, nostalgia about the past. What do you think that's about? Well, our narratives that have a patriotic element are important uh, be, uh, because they, they, narratives thrive on identity. This is my story. Uh, identity economics, that's another phrase that has been used by my co-author, George, George Ackerman, Ackerman. Uh, and, and others. Timur uh, Quran also uses that phrase. Uh, that people really care who they are. It, it's when, it's when, you, uh, when you see Britain praised for what people do in London, uh, you assume that it's praised for you. Mm. Uh, most of us do that. But you, a sense of distance can uh, suddenly appear. Uh, and then suddenly it's those other people, those foreigners living in London. Uh, and when you walk down the street in London, you see many people who look like they're not English. Uh, that perception has become a narrative. Uh, and so it loses, uh, we, you lose the sense of sympathy to successes that you see in London. Mm. Another question, should governments use branding and advertising services to promote positive narratives? say, to foster civil society or to promote better health or... Should the government do should that? Should the government do that? Well, they... Uh, I think they do that, right? Uh, well, they do public, public health notices and anti-smoking campaigns. Yeah. Uh, but, and policymakers and politicians often try and talk up the economy. That's often a, a yeah. narrative that they try and sell. It's, it's not symbolic of the separation of the, the state and the press, to me, to have the government doing that. Uh, they do have websites, you know, mm. uh, and you can look up government statements, but those aren't, uh, probably not consumed by many people. Uh, yes. So you have uh, uh, regular statements. Or, uh, it started in the U.S. with Franklin Roosevelt, who had his fireside chats on the radio. Uh, mm. 
and, uh, but it still wasn't presented as, uh, as an advertisement. It wasn't glitzy. They didn't have jingles to songs, <laughs> which is part of modern marketing now. Yes. And that's, in some ways, you know, that authenticity uh, is partly why Trump's tweeting is seen as authentic and therefore believed by many people, for better or worse. Well, the, the sense of political correctness is, is a narrative that people are too politically correct now. Hmm. And I, I remember watching the Republican debates. I found Donald Trump amusing. And he was the only guy who wasn't bland. He would say things that were politically incorrect. And it's, he's suddenly fun to watch. And so he used that narrative uh, to his own advantage hmm. by flaunting it. Although he is politically correct. He's very careful about how he contradicts political correctness. So I've got a, uh, a different angle. As an anthropologist, I'm struggling to see what this framework adds to the study of narrative. Is it just a simple analogy between contagious disease and stories? Well, uh, my book is in some sense a research proposal, uh, and it looks for successes in the past. Mm -hmm. If you look at the epidemiology literature, uh, there has been so many different models. And partly that's necess necessary because different epidemics are different. Some of them are spread by mosquitoes, right? And so yeah. that's not the same as a spread by interpersonal encounter. It involves animals as well as, uh, uh, as people. Uh, so uh, I, I don't have a recipe. Uh, I don't have a canonical model. I think this is uh, a, a profession. We need a profession involved with this. Yes. Let me um, take you another direction. Is, how do you think narratives have impacted the rise of feminist movements? Uh, okay. The, uh, uh, well, uh, we have sexual roles that uh, are differentiated and they're arbitrary based on history. Uh, narratives about famous women are something that has been, or uh, important women, has been something that has been slowly driving a change in our society mm. over hundreds of years. Mm. So, um, yeah, I was just reading an article from 1842 about famous women poets. It's 1842. And they had a whole article about none of these women I'd ever heard of, <laughs> but but they were. St but it takes so long for that. It's a it's a low contagion, and low re uh, recovery narrative uh, that that has been going on for a couple hundred years, uh, and there's a sense of inevitability. But it it does. It's it's amazing how slow it's happening. Yes. Yes. But it is a narrative. So uh, we do try to uh, find narratives that support women, and that's a good thing to do. But it has to be, uh, uh, it has to be. Ada Lovelace was forgotten. You know Ada Lovelace? No. Uh, she was uh, the daughter of Lord Byron, I think. Yes. And yes. Um, she uh, was a very th spirited woman for the day. Uh, and she met Charles Babbage, who is reputed to be the uh, inventor of the computer, although he couldn't make one, but he described it. And Ada Lovelace wrote the first computer program. Uh, but she was totally forgotten until they discovered her, I don't know how, how long ago. But I don't know if I'm getting a lot of recognition. Her, her narrative needs a little bit more boosting. More of a telling, more of a telling. <clears throat> okay, different direction. What is the relationship between memes, not the Dawkins kind, and narratives? What is Bob's view on memes? Okay, uh, memes is a, phrase, a word coined by Richard Dawkins uh, in his book, The Selfish Gene, mm. around 1975, to refer to uh, thought viruses that would spread uh, from person to person. Uh, so he was, uh, I, I view him as a very sympathetic figure. Uh, its meaning has changed somewhat. By the way, there were earlier phrases. Uh, there were, uh, in um, Henry George used uh, uh, something about contagion of ideas. 
and uh, there, there was a term, uh, idea of microbes, as well as thought. It, before 1895, you couldn't refer to viruses because they hadn't been discovered yet. So it was <laughs> idea of microbes. So these ideas are, are going away. But the, 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 you said in different, Richard Dawkins' meaning of the word meme has changed now, and it seems to refer to silly, frivolous internet things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, like pictures of cute animals. Or right, something. cat, lots of kittens. <laughs> or kittens. <laughs> lots of kittens. So, uh, but I had trouble searching for meme uh, on, on databases because it keeps coming up with the French word me mem. Mem, which means the same. And so you can't, even in English, you search in English, that French word keeps popping up. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing you can do about it. Okay, let me see what else I've got. Uh, maybe I'll give you one last finance question. And we've sort of touched on this. Is the yield curve inversion a self-fulfilling prophecy because market participants worry, or self-extinguishing because government reacts to prevent recession? Oh, okay. Uh, so the US cut interest rates recently. Mm. Uh, after they had seen an inverted yield curve. So they are aware of the narrative and they don't want to. The narrative is kind of strange. I can see an economic theory that the spread between uh, long and short rates might uh, predict recessions. But why does it matter when it suddenly drops down by a tenth of a percentage point and mm. puts it into negative territory? Then it becomes a headline story. Mm. That doesn't support, unless it's a narrative, there's no, there's no reason to think that actually being precisely below zero matters. Mm. Uh, so yeah, the narratives are, uh, are something that the central bank has to take account of and has to recognize that it may be uh, m more their statement accompanying the action that, uh, that, that matters. That statement is, uh, is dissected as if it were something from heaven yes. uh, that uh, in, instead of just the arbitrary result of a committee. Yes. Do you think, one of, the, one of the tools that central bankers use to try and shape behavior in financial markets after the crisis was, of course, forward guidance, which is basically narrative. If the central bank, and, and central bankers started to treat forward guidance as a policy tool, just like interest rates and quantitative easing, and sort of as part of the toolkit, when you look at how that forward guidance was used in recent years, do you think that attempt to use a narrative to shape economic behavior was successful or not? Oh, I think it was successful. And I also think not just forward guidance, but also uh, interest, uh, inflation targeting, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of diffused the story then, because the Fed we used to be trying to guess their intentions, and yes. now we know exactly uh, what their intentions are. Uh, uh, one of the narratives I describe in my book is the uh, uh, wage price spiral mm. narrative uh, that uh, led to uh, fear about future inflation. So they, they made it, inflation was an insoluble problem because you had angry labor unions pushing for wage Higher increases. Wages. And then what do the employer do once he's caved into union demands? What can he do but raise uh, prices? And then the unions come back saying, because prices are higher, we need another. That was the narrative. Mm -hmm. It was a company, there was a constellation of narratives around the time of Thatcher, uh, which were, North, and in the US as well, where labor unions were demonized. It became like those labor unions are stealing money from me through inflation. You imagined if you weren't unionized that your, your, your pay would be lagging behind. Mm -hmm. And there, there was a different kind of polarization of society then. So it, it was a narratively driven phenomenon. Mm. We don't hear a wage price spiral much at all anymore. Mm. It's interesting, as I th try and draw out some of the policy implications of what you've described, it seems to me that policymakers need to be very narrative aware um, and use the kind of analysis and, and, and patterns that you've developed to think about narratives, but then also to, to, um, to
to think much more about actively managing narratives and to and to. So to, we don't want to use that term, actively managing I know. narrative. And so how about uh, eloquence in speech, <laughs> something like that? Yes, yes. To kind of to to shape because recognizing that you know if a, if a bad narrative is prevailing, people will react to it and behave, and that will have real economic outcomes. It isn't just stories on the internet anymore. It's actual, you know, you can see it affecting consumer behavior in the, in the fears around a no-deal Brexit, for example, and what's happening with people, firms stocking inventories and so on. And that has yeah. real economic costs. Um, and thinking more proactively about that rather than treating it as just stories that people are talking about, I think is, is, is a real insight. Well, I think you know, we have to get past the thinking that uh, it's unprofessional to talk about narratives. Yes, yes, I think that's I, I, When I, I that's presented right. this in front of the American Economic Association, it was with such, some trepidation. <laughs> I had a, a big audience of all economists, but they applauded. <laughs> they <laughs> <took the end. laughs> and do you see a growth in the field? Are you seeing... Yeah, I think it is. It's growing. Uh, graduate students have to be counseled against being fearful of taking on something different. Uh, I, th I think graduate students in all fields make the mistake of jumping on to popular topics that are really, you'd think they would be forward thinking, but th they feel it's fearful that mm -hmm. they won't get a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was placement officer at Yale for some years, and I got the sense from employers that they, re that potential employers of PhDs in economics that they do respect uh, people who jump out and do something really different. Okay. Well, I think that might be a good place to uh, pause. Let me check if there are any more questions. I think I've covered most of the ones who've, that have come in online. I've got maybe one last one here and one there, and then we can wrap up. How's that? So in short, um, I just wanted to understand how this new idea of uh, narrative economics works with the idea of um, uh, randomness. So wouldn't creating or looking for narratives in economics or economics phenomena create um, more, uh, a higher danger of a hindsight bias, for instance? Uh, that's a complicated question. I don't know if I have a, a good answer. So Nassim Taleb wrote a mm. best-selling book called Fooled by Randomness that <laughs> was in the form of a novel that but it was his own life experience, that uh, people uh, don't take into account how random their lives really are. And the people that you admire as successes are uh, people who've had random things. Donald Trump, part of his success is his last name, which sounds, uh, actually his last name, his grandfather changed it from Drumpf uh, to, to Trump. And now it becomes a card finesse uh, in gambling. It suggests a person. Mm -hmm. It is exactly how he's lived his life. And it, it, it's, it's a promotional genius. Thank Trump's grandfather. <laughs> uh, and so that's perfect for Trump. That was perfectly random that he both got the name Trump. And a bit of an inheritance. And he got, uh, <laughs> he, he, he was inheriting effectively a billion dollars at a time when young people adore billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg and mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, uh, who uh, are our heroes. Uh, so it just was a, a random con confluence of mm -hmm. events that led to his. Uh, and, but Trump uh, may not be fully appreciative of the role of randomness in his uh, ascent. Uh, judging from the way he talks, I don't think he is <laughs> fully appreciative of that. There was one here in the middle, yes, the woman in the back. If you don't mind, you can, you can shout and I can repeat it if the mic doesn't get to you in time. Uh, any ideas on antidotes to counter fake narratives? Antidotes to counter fake narratives? Yeah. Well, uh, Thanks a lot for making that remark on our nightmarish president back in Brazil. Oh, in Brazil? Thank you. Yeah. Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro. I actually, I actually tried to stop. I, I got a, uh, an email from Brazil just before his election, and they asked me if I would record a brief video clip with my views on Bolsonaro. 
Uh, and I, it was against my better, I shouldn't get involved with Brazil, <laughs> uh, but I did. Uh, and uh, I got back a, a tons of hate mail from Brazil, <laughs> and I decided I'll never do that again. <laughs> but but uh, Bolsonaro, this is the case of, I, I, don't know, I don't know a whole lot about him, but it seems to me, and I might be in error, that he got inspiration from Donald Trump. <laughs> Lots of people have mm -hmm. learned a new approach to politics, yeah. uh, and uh, he's, he's one of the examples. That's again a narrative yeah. affecting us uh, and, on a worldwide scale. Yeah. The really important thing is that we are one world now, yeah. and I'm involved with Brazil. I'm afraid if I can go back to Brazil now after having done that. Well, the only hope, I think, is as you described, these narratives peak and then they, and then they disappear. So you may just have to wait but a bit. But sometimes <laughs> they don't disappear. So, you know, mm -hmm. Plato wrote a uh, philosophy, and he was brilliant to know, let's do it in the form of dialogues. Mm -hmm. You observe, people are so open to narratives, so I'll write my philosophy in imaginary dialogues. And we're still reading them 2,000 years later. So sometimes the narrative can be very long, the long epidemic lived. can be very long. But maybe in another thousand years it will disappear. <laughs> well, that won't get you to Brazil in this <laughs> lifetime. Uh, I think we have time for one more here, if you don't mind. There's a mic coming your way. Hello. Um, I'm a journalist from Turkey. Oh. And, uh, and our president, Erdogan, has recently taken up a new narrative. And uh, his economic team has taken up a new narrative that reducing interest rates will reduce oh, yeah. inflation. So, uh, but they provide no evidence. So we're just going, we're just seeing as we go. Uh, and I'm wondering what sort of an economic consequence, without using an adjective, what sort of an economic consequence that could bring. Thank you. I, uh, I've been trying to figure out the Erdogan narrative. I like to watch, I recommend you do this, watch speakers in, the, speak, uh, in giving speeches in their own language with English subtitles. So all you have to do is search Erdogan with English subtitles, and you'll get a nice translation. Hmm. Uh, so I, I thought, you know, he's very different from Donald Trump. Uh, he's very mild-mannered, at least. He didn't get, Donald Trump is angry a lot. Hmm. Uh, so he has a different style. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't equate him with Donald Trump. But th that, that statement that he thinks that higher interest rates lead to higher inflation is, is quoted a lot. It, it went viral. Mm. Uh, and I don't think he's ever come back to defend that idea. Mm. It's contrary to economics. Uh, it's a bit like the Laffer curve example, which uh, well, you give in the in book, book. Uh, which is, you know, you lower tax rates and you get increased revenue. And, you know, that, also, that, that was a narrative that prevailed for a while, but in the end was misproven by reality. But but the Laffer Curve people haven't accepted any of this proof that's coming back. So that's a case of a recurrent narrative. Narrative, fair enough, fair enough. I think we've run out of time, but I think, uh, Bob, you've certainly given us a huge amount to think about. I think some of uh, us will go away and start thinking about the world in narrative economics terms and hopefully develop ever more insights uh, as a result of that. So thank you so much for doing that. And let's thank Paul for those talks.